cool. Awesome. Thank you for joining us, Abby. Of course. Of course. Are we ready to rock and roll? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. <clears throat> awesome. Well, I will start because I want to have time for questions and answers. I love that part, um, talking to, to you all today. So um, <clears throat> my name is Abby, and I'm a marine biologist. Um, and I can talk to you about my career path. It has been all over the place. I've done a lot of different research from marine mammals to salmon. Uh, a lot of my work has been in the tide pools. Um, so I do a lot of intertidal research. And then now I work for an organization, which I'll talk to you about today, which is Marine Applied Research and Exploration. So our acronym is MARE. So I now work for MARE as the education director. And I'm here today to talk to you about the oceans, uh, the work that MARE does to help protect the oceans. And then I'll kind of finish with a little bit about STEM careers and things like that. Okay, so we'll get started. Just gonna... Here we go. Let's see if this works today. Maybe, maybe not. Here we go. Our oceans. So, whoops. Oh my gosh, that's my calendar, not the oceans. Sorry, y'all. Okay, let's try that again. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> so, Mari, my whole life has been protecting, my career has been around protecting the oceans. The oceans are super vital to us as humans on this planet. And probably as you may not know or know, the oceans make up a large part of our planet. They cover over 70% of our planet and they impact all of us as humans. And some people don't know that and some people do, but it does. So they provide us food to eat. They provide nearly all of the oxygen we breathe. It provides us with fresh water. It helps moderate our climate and it impacts our weather. So it has a huge role. And if we do not protect it, um, it has consequences for us as humans, and it's really important to know that as large as the ocean is, it has limited resources, and we need to, to work to protect those resources. And just like on land, the ocean has its own bout of challenges that it faces right now. So again, we have issues with overfishing. We're taking a lot um, out of the ocean, and it's not being able to replenish itself we have challenges with regards to climate change. So within that, we have things like sea level rise um, and ocean warming temperatures that are impacting ocean life. And then we also have challenges with ocean pollution. So plastics, microplastics, runoff, um, all are beating down on this ecosystem right now and it needs our help. And so to help, um, some things that we're doing to help, in addition to that, is um, especially in California, a lot of people don't know about this, but I think it's really cool because California is in a very special place with regard to ocean protection. So in California, we have a bunch of our ocean and coastline that's actually protected. And there's three or there's two different types of protection that we actually have going on. Um, we have the federal government, which is set up national marine sanctuaries all over the United States. And we actually have three national marine sanctuaries along our coastline. So Monterey, Santa Cruz, all the way up north of California. A lot of that is protected um, federally. And then in addition to that, the state of California about 10 years ago wanted to protect our resources some more. So they set up what we call a network of 124 marine protected areas along our entire coastline from the Oregon border all the way down to the Mexico border. So there are different various shapes and sizes, these state MPAs, but like for the federal and the state, just think of them, we have national parks on our land. So we have places like Yosemite, Yellowstone that we have set aside to protect on land. We have now done the same thing or we are trying to do the same thing in our oceans to help protect those resources. So for the marine protected areas in our state, um, a lot of them really do manage um, fishing. So trying to protect a certain species. So in some of these MPAs, we cannot take or fish for specific species that are threatened. Um, and then other, they have different jurisdictions, but they just run our entire state line and they're set up to help protect us. And why do we care about this? Or why am I talking about this? Because my organization, MARE, um, helps collect deep sea information in all of these marine protected areas, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second. 
So who we are, I'm going to show you a quick video of our executive director talking more, just a little bit of background about who we are as Mari. So let's see if this works. With our oceans, we've explored about 5%, and most of that is to scuba depths. So that leaves 95% of our ocean unexplored. So in other words, we know more about Pluto than we do about our ocean. Our ocean is changing rapidly, and it's a combination of reasons. There's climate change, pollution, sewage outfalls that are dumping into the oceans. We're seeing a lot of changes in a relatively short time that are unprecedented. So these are changes that we need to understand now to avert them in the future. I think the greatest needs in ocean conservation are really basing the management, the policy on sound foundation of science. Mari was created to get the unknown of the deep water data. We go down and get the foundational information and then we bring that to results, figuring out what it means, looking at our fishing laws, looking at our stewardship, our pollution, all the factors, including climate, that are affecting the oceans and parsing out what's working and what's not. If we have in place a law that's working, that's fantastic. Let's trumpet that success. But if it's not working, let's change that law to something better. My works in between conservation and science. We collect unbiased information and we work with other conservation groups and scientists and academic institutions to develop the technologies we need to gather the information and then analyze that information so that it can be used effectively. What we're talking about is sustainable fishing for future generations. So in order to do that, we need to take care of the resource, which means we need to understand it. In order to understand it, we need to dive down and get that information. Sweet. Let's see if it will let me move forward. OK, nope. OK, so MARE, Marine Applied Research and Exploration. So we're a nonprofit organization, which was started in 2003. And as you can see there, we use underwater robots, which we call ROVs, to go down to deep sea habitats to help collect information in order to inform management and protect and record what actually is down in these important resources. Has anybody ever heard of an ROV before that's sitting there today? Or is that brand new? Yeah, you can say yeah or no, no. Like maybe, like this, like maybe, like a little bit. We'll talk more about them. Okay, cool. Um, so our team uh, or our office or our organization is uh, comprised of a bunch of different skill sets. So we have a bunch of ocean engineers. So we have engineers on our team that actually designed and have built all of the ROVs and robots that we use for all this deep water work. So we have a huge technology component to our office. And then we also have a suite of scientists, biologists, and policy experts that help um, implement and analyze all of the data that we collect. And <clears throat> We have a research boat, which is actually north, uh, right in the Bay, San Francisco Bay. So one of our offices is in Richmond. And then we also have another office, which is in Northern California and Eureka. So I just talked about ROV, remotely operated vehicle. And I heard some people like, maybe I've heard of that before. And there's tons of different options for ROVs. So for us, for Mari, what we consider an ROV is one, it's unoccupied. There are, under, there are other robots or underwater vehicles that hold humans in them. If you've seen them like little tiny bubble submarines, ours are not occupied. So they're more of like big, huge, like cars that you could drive under the water. Um, they need to work underwater. So we drive, uh, we use them in ocean habitats and so they need to be able to go to various depths. And then we need to be able to maneuver around in the ocean really easily. So um, different coral reef habitats and, and, and substrates like that. So we need to move around. And so that is how we define our ROV. <clears throat> And so this is one of this is our largest ROV. It's the ROV Beagle, and you can see here it's on the back of our research vessel, uh, heading out to a research site along the California coast. I'll just show you a video of how we kind of do the work that we do. 
So this first video is just showing you, so there's the research boat that you saw a still picture of. So what we do is we actually release or launch the ROV off the back of a research boat. And as you can see, the ROV starts to drive away from the research boat. And then once a safe distance, it will start to dive down to the deep sea environment. This is live footage from deep sea environment, which I'll talk more about what deep sea is in a second. But while we're down there, um, we are taking video imagery, we are taking still imagery, and we have a bunch of sensors on our ROV so we can collect um, water chemistry, temperature, depth, and other really important information that we can then characterize the habitat with a little bit more. So I just used the word deep sea. Has anybody ever heard of the deep sea before? Like, like, yay, thumbs up, thumbs down, like a middle, like a, yeah, cool. Okay, I like it, thank you. Um, so yeah, deep sea. So Mari, most, uh, we spend most of our time researching deep sea environments. And for those who have not heard about the deep sea, we define the deep sea as anything uh, more than 200 meters. So 200 meters, so if you look at this infographic, that's the middle line here, um, the deep sea light can penetrate to about 200 meters in water or ocean water, which is about 656 feet. Anything after that light is pretty much gone. So especially down past a thousand meters, which is about 3000 feet, there is no more light. So if you close your eyes right now and put yourself in a closet and then open them and it's pitch black, it is pitch black down there. And it's a really important part of our ocean that is really underexplored. And in order to get down there, we need important and hardcore and awesome technology. And that's where Mari comes in because we need to build the technology to get down to research these important areas. And so we just talked about it. So I'm sure when you think about marine biology or ocean conservation research, we, we have a lot of groups out there that are um, diving to get a lot of information. We work with a lot of dive groups to help um, characterize an entire MPA or area. So divers are great for shallow water environments, but as humans, we are limited on what we can do. We can only be underwater for so long and only carry so much equipment. Um, and so that's where robots come in. So having this brand new or newer technology of underwater robots, we can get down to 3,000, 4,000 feet. We can have dives that are almost eight hours long, and we can carry a whole suite of equipment. So we're just collecting just a lot of information at once, which just makes our trips way more valuable. And so you saw the video of the ROV being launched off the back of the boat. So this is the other component, which you don't see normally. So once the ROV is released off the back of the boat, it then dives down to the research area. And the ROV, if you see in the schematic, there's a green line here, that's called the tether. So our ROVs are connected to the boat at all times. And that tether is how the ROV gets power, but and then it's also a transmission between data. So we are giving the ROV data and the data is giving us back the video footage and the water information and all that stuff simultaneously. So once at depth, then if you see in the picture here, this is one of our scientists, Nisa, and she has a big controller, like it looks like a big video game control on her lap. That is actually a controller to drive the ROV. So we use a controller to then fly, or they call it flying around um, the research area to collect the information um, that we're looking for on a specific day. So here's Dirk, our executive director again, um, talking a little bit more about the parts of our ROV Beagle. This is the business end of the remotely operated vehicle. This is where we have all of our cameras and sensors and lights. So for example, the pilot uses this camera down here for flying the ROV. In addition, we have a vertical camera and a digital still camera. These are both pointed down. All of the cameras have lasers on them that are spread 10 centimeters apart. So any fish or invertebrate that we tag or hit with those lasers, then we can scale it. We know exactly how big it is. And these are acoustic tracking beacons. They say, here I am. And we triangulate uh, the ROV's location to the ship uh, position. And we know exactly where every frame of video and where every digital still photograph is taken. And that we put into the database. 
sweet. Okay. So Mari works in a lot of different environments as we talked about the deep sea. So we can go down to 3000 feet, um, but we also do work in some shallow water coral reef environments. And we need different um, technologies and different ROVs to do that kind of work. And so we have a, a suite of actually in, um, robots to help us get that done. So right now, um, our office has designed and built, and we have a fleet of five different ROVs and robots that help us get the information done, depending on where we're going. So this left one here, the green one, which we've talked about, it's been the highlight of my presentation. <clears throat> It is our ROV Beagle. It's kind of our main workhorse. And as you can see in this chart, um, it is the Beagle can go down the deepest. So it definitely does a lot of our deep water work. It's built to withstand high pressure, cold environments. Um, it also is really cool. You, we add um, a manipulator arm to this ROV so we can actually collect um, coral samples and other samples of substrates when we're down there so we can bring them back up to the surface for scientists to do some more research on, which is pretty cool. And then if you counter that, um, this yellow one here, <clears throat> which we call the batfish, is our newest one that we've just built and designed. And we actually just took the batfish to the British Virgin Islands to do some shallow coral reef work. And this one's a little, this one's different than all the other ones. Um, Cause if you look at this, the depth, it, it's really meant for shallow water. And then it does, if you look at the self-propelled section, it says no. So all of these other ROVs kind of drive, they, they have thrusters on them and they drive themselves around um, just like you would have a remote control car. However, the Batfish uses a little bit of a different technology where it is towed behind a boat, kind of as you would tow a water skier behind the boat. And it has these really cool articulated wings that they built. So it could basically fly along the sea floor and kind of really, contour the sea floor to get close to those coral reefs that we're looking at. So yeah. So research. We're doing all this stuff. Let's talk more about that. So we have a team of people out there helping to collect this information. So this picture here, so when we go on what we call an expedition or a cruise, we have a team of scientists and engineers that are out on the boat doing all the work. So in terms of, as you think about um, career choices, which I'll talk more about um, this. So on the boat, we have biologists or marine biologists and engineers. The biologists help drive the ROV uh, around in the research area, make sure that we're researching the same area. They're also looking through the live feed for both um, patterns of things that we've already seen, but a lot of the times we see new things all the time. So just checking that out. We have a team of engineers that are on the boat to help with all of the tech that is involved with the ROV to make sure nothing's leaking, the ROV is collecting all of this information and to make sure that is all squared away. And then another champion job that we have or role at MARI is we need to now analyze all that data. So we have eight, 10, 12, 20, 30 hours worth of video footage and photos characterizing the habitat that we just looked at and we have to analyze it. And so we have a whole team of biologists and video analysts that go through all of those hours and they identify every fish they measure every fish and every invertebrate and characterize all the habitat, which is then put into a database, which is kind of crazy. It's amazing. So, um, so I'll just show you some of the really cool things that they've seen over the last couple of years, just kind of showcasing some of the critters and animals you see. If you look at the screen here, there's a bunch of numbers kind of running around on both sides. Um, this one's kind of fun to look at right here where my cursor is, is the D. This is actually the depth. So we're about 250 meters at that point. So it's almost 700 feet below the ocean surface. Um, we just see all these amazing things. And all the light that you see right now is actually created by the ROV. So if it was not for the ROV, it would be very dark down there. But this is just us um, doing some research and just kind of showing you different habitats and things that we see down there. Um, rockfish are really important in our marine protected areas because they're a fish species. So just one of that. And then we get to see kind of cool stuff like this, which are amazing. Who doesn't like octopus? I love octopus. Um, <clears throat> it's the giant Pacific. It's always cool to see. 
Okay, let's go back. Do, do, do. So we collect all this information. What do we do with it? So we actually make maps of where the animals live, who's living there, and the habitat. And it's really important to make these maps, especially for the marine protected areas that we're helping, especially for the state of California that we're working with, so that we can compare over time. So for example, there's a marine protected area that they have said, okay, we're no, we're no longer gonna fish X fish. And so we've been going back there for 10 years now, looking at data year after year, are those fish populations getting better? Are they increasing? And we can only monitor change over time as if we can compare over time. And so we have to keep going back to these places, which is really important to keep looking at them um, to, to make sure that we're seeing good changes. And so with the deep sea, it is it's such a cool place and it's so undiscovered. Like Dirk said, only 5% of the ocean is explored. So there's so much more that we don't know and we cannot protect